Hey guys, how's it going? Kevin Cleary here with a knife video for you. And today I want to talk about knives that are not worth the money. That is knives where the value consideration just is pretty out of whack. You know, perhaps we could say these are knives where we are way, way, way past the point of diminishing returns. And I think you understand, you know, the, that as the price of a knife increases, there are some benefits that come with those increases up to probably around 150 bucks, right? And then past that, it, it it really is a matter of diminishing returns. You can see very, very minor improvements, uh, but you will pay exponentially more for those very, very small improvements. And so I want to talk about that a little bit here. I want to talk about some features and functions of knives that stand out to me as being particularly poor examples of, you know, going be above and beyond paying a whole lot of extra money out of pocket and not getting, uh, you know, relative and not getting an equal amount of performance relative to how much you're spending. Now, one of the knives that always gets brought up in this discussion, and rightly so, is going to be uh, the Chris Reeve, probably the Sabenza. That's the knife people are most familiar with. This happens to be the Inkosi, which is my particularly favorite Chris Reeve. And this, of course, is the Tanto, which I absolutely love. You can see, sorry, my sharpening... Uh, I didn't bother. I just sharpened it. I didn't bother. And I don't care to put a mere polish on it. Um, I want a knife that's sharp. I really don't care how the, the edge looks. So um, let's talk about the, the Sebenza for a minute. Uh, first of all, let me say in general that titanium frame locks, okay, are you know, they're luxury items, okay? Uh, there, there's no need for titanium on a folding knife in terms of, you know, functional, you know, practical additions to performance, okay? So we've got to put that out there right away um, that, yeah, there's no need to have a titanium frame lock in the first place. You know, something made of G10 is going to do just as well and perhaps and probably even better, especially in terms of weight to strength ratio um, that that's, that's got to be sort of thrown out there. Now, I will say a couple of things about this, and that is there are some, some features being delivered by Chris Reeve, especially the Inkosi, that you're not going to get on every knife. The size and longevity of the hardware is really second to none. Now, let me quickly add that, you know, large washers, large overbuilt, oversized hardware it is not... Um, you know, I, I would argue anyway that, you know, this knife, if you shrunk down the hardware and used a, a blade grind that wasn't as specialized, you know, could you could you knock three hundred dollars off the off the production price? No. Right. That, you know, you're not. You're not. <laughs> so so I do have to say this when you get a, a Sebenza. Uh, or Chris Reeve knives in general, uh, there are some features, there are some things that they're doing that no one else is doing. And it's not that no one else could do it, um, it's just that they don't bother. Okay, so I've got to put that out there, uh, that there are a couple things that relate to the longevity and toughness and durability of the knife that Chris Reeve does really, really well on. Um, but could could you know does cold steel do something similar with the longevity of their locks sure they do um now i don't know of anybody that uses a nice big pivot the way chris reeve does i think that's a huge feature i don't know of anybody who uses hardware that's substantially sized the way that uh, chris reeve does but again there are other ways to to skin those cats that that don't cost as much money and then would be equally functional so the first thing i want to talk about there is you know the, the Sebenza and other Chris Reeve knives and really titanium frame locks in general are not delivering a huge value. They're wildly popular, I know, and there are some budget options out there, but you're not, hold on. Sorry about that, guys. I was had to had to reach for this knife. Uh, this is the Real Steel G frame, um, and it's a pretty budget-friendly option in terms of, of titanium frame locks. Uh, and so we could kind of do this and, and represent a, a range of, of prices there. So um, this is sort of, you know, you, you can get something in the bottom end for a pretty reasonable price point. But even that, you know, you can buy the G10 version of this and, and it'll be just as, 
as good. Okay, it won't be called the G frame then because it won't be a frame lock. Um, so that's that's the first thing that I have to say about that. Now let's keep the Riot here because one of the things we talk about when it comes to Riot knives and a few other brands is the action, right? How smooth is that deployment? What kind of bearings are in here? Uh, and and this knife does feel incredible. All right, it does. It feels fantastic. And there are other knives that feel equally good and even better. You know, I think of um, the Grimsmo stuff, the Rask and the Norseman, uh, the Holt Spectre skiff bearings, right? Skiff knives and the, and the bearings that are in there. Uh, Shirogorovs are especially impressive. Uh, and of course, Riot knives are pretty, not, are pretty darn good as well. But guess what? <laughs> um, knives that sell on the smoothness of the action are not an efficient use of fun funds. Uh, first of all, you know, the action is a tertiary component at best, right? The main things that a knife needs to do is cut well and feel really good in hand. Those two things are actually going to affect how that tool works when you're trying to do its job. Um, how the knife opens really is not terribly relevant, okay? You know, think about, you know, here's a, here's a knife that... Yeah, it doesn't have really smooth drop shutty action or anything like that. Uh, and yet functionally it's, it's completely fine. Okay. Um, so knives that sell on, on action there, you're, it's, it's a waste of money. Right? It's a waste of money that lots of us enjoy doing. Okay, well, There are lots of ways we can waste our money. This is one of them. But you're not getting any real upgrades to performance. Uh, and let me say this. Anytime you try to max out a particular feature, that tends to be costly, right? So, so when you say, you know, let's make a knife to the tightest tolerances that we possibly can, the way the Grimsmos do, and they do a fantastic job of it, but they, they pursue that goal at any cost, and it goes well beyond what is practical or sensible. Okay, so that's the next one. Knives, really all knives that sell on action, and there are lots of them out there, Wii knives, uh, Riot knives, you know, all of them, so, a lot of them are titanium frame locks as well, so now they're kind of getting hit doubly. Um, but th this is, you know, hey, if you want to spend your money on it, I know I spent some of my money on it. I I'm not complaining about it, but I'm just letting you know, if you're watching this, trying to to think, what are the things that I really should be looking for in a practical cutting tool? Most of the things on this list are going to be stuff that isn't helping. All right. Um, next, integrals. I don't happen to have an example of an integral, but I have had a few. I enjoy them. They're really cool. Uh, and I think right now... Um, Wee Knives does the best job of building an integral. Um, Riot does a does an okay job as well. Um, when when they go out of their way, the the Jack, for example, is a is a magnificent example of an integral. Uh, but all right, the fact that this whole handle is one piece doesn't doesn't change anything substantial. Okay, I'm not getting a huge performance upgrade by having this one milled solid piece of whatever, whether it be titanium or aluminum or G10 or F or or, or uh, micarta or anything else. Okay, so integrals are definitely not worth the money. Um, the next thing here that is to be brought up kind of you know we've got some carbon fiber represented here we've got some over here on uh, the benchmade uh in this case it's uh forged carbon fiber um you know and and titanium perhaps to a lesser extent i'm going to move this one out of the way uh but this is you know this is just you know touching sort of the bottom of the barrel when it comes to fancy materials there's mokutai and um damas steel and all kinds of, you know, the I don't, for a while there, it was popular to use like the paint that they scraped off of the floor of Ford. Uh, I guess they called it Fordite. And that, you know, I thought that was the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. Anyway, 
there are a bunch of fancy materials out there. Some of them look really cool and I get it, right? I, I like stuff that looks cool as well, but I have to, you know, if we're honest, we've got to admit that those are not adding anything in terms of actual performance to our knives. All right. The same is even true of fancy blade steels, uh, fancy materials for sure. Um, are, are not doing much to help us, you know, but in addition, right, the carbon fiber here adds nothing. Uh, neither does it over here. The G10 version of this knife is, you know, if you took this off and put the G10 scales back on, it, you've done nothing to, to enhance performance or, or reduce performance. You just spent money for no good reason. Okay. Um, there may be a time. So I will say this, this will be a bit of a preview. Um, I have a, a new PM2 coming in S45 VN, and I am going to switch out the scales for some of the uh, Flytanium Lotus scales because those, I think, will have an impact on ergonomics. And I'll talk about that in, in more detail when, uh, when those, that arrives. But that may be, you know, so there are some modifications you can make, but that does bring me to... Uh, another point and that is modifications like this so i've got these really really cool scales and they truly do look fantastic on this knife all right i absolutely love the way this whole thing came together but uh, i didn't add any performance and furthermore <laughs> i'm not going to be able to get a lot more out of this knife you know so i'm into this for a decent amount of money right nothing to sneeze at anyway um and if I sell this, it's a pretty tough sell. Uh, now, I will say these days, mine is one of the few out there like this. So, you know, I'm not planning to sell it, but if I was, it would cost a little more. I would not easily let go of this knife. Um, but again, I, I likely would not get out of it what I put into it. It's really, really rare for you to get out of a knife the, the money for the modifications that you may have made to it. Uh, this brings me to another example of this, uh, one which I like a lot, by the way, and, and uh, have enjoyed some of the knives, but one that particularly stands out to me are Spyderco's that are done in you know collaboration with other with with famous makers like I think of the Swayback or the Subvert. Um, those knives are really really cool, and I love the Spyderco Subvert. I, it's one of the coolest knives that are available out there. However, the Drunken would be another example. Um, these knives are really really cool. They're really nice looking knives, but you probably would have been better buying this right from a performance standpoint. Uh, the Manix is is fantastic, as is the Para, as are a number of other sort of more practical Spydercos. And, and you're not paying that considerable upcharge, you know, one, for the fancy materials again, two, for the that designer's name to be on that knife. Um, and by the way, uh, you know, I, I still think it's cool, and I think those designers ought to be paid for their design if Spyderco wants to use them. That's, that's completely uh, the way it should be. However, all right, you're not, you're paying for uh, some designer to allow Spyderco to use his knife, and you're not paying for actual performance out of the box. Now, let me say this. Um, I should say that custom knives in general, okay, are going to be a waste of money. I know that probably hurts a number of you watching. It kind of hurts me to say it. Um, and if you're a custom maker out there, just bear with me for a second, okay? Um, I have a friend who makes custom exhaust systems. And from time to time, I'll, we'll talk about um, how that goes. And one of the things he repeatedly has to tell people is, you know, if you can go to Canadian Tire, which is an automotive store here in Canada, uh, if you can go to Canadian Tire and buy an exhaust for your car, you don't want me to make it because you would pay way, way more. Because if you can stamp something out by the millions in a factory, it costs way less per unit than it does to have some skilled craftsman work for hours making the same thing. Okay, so custom knives you buy because you like that maker you buy because it's a unique design you buy because of the unique and interesting features that they include okay you don't buy them because you want an efficient cutting tool that would not make sense at all 
All right. Um, and, and for some people it'll just be, and, and by the way, a lot of the things that I'm talking about are very luxury purpose, uh, luxury items. Okay. That's, that's one of the things we have to point out here is that, um, you know, the titanium and the Mokotai and the, the, uh, you know, perfect, perfect action and the, the custom builds and the modifications. These are all luxury items that we're fortunate to be able to enjoy. And we ought to be aware of just how fortunate we are. Uh, and of course, if you're watching this, you, you know, it's not wrong to want some of those upgrades. It's not wrong to enjoy some of those upgrades. But if you're looking for, again, just a really practical, reliable cutting tool, those are things that you can avoid to save yourself a bit of money. And finally, the one that I want to touch on that is um, that, that gets a lot of discussion, that's why I put it at the bottom of the list, is high-end blade steels. Look, I love high-end steels. We got 20 CV here. We got more 20 CV here. Um, you know, we've got M390. Uh, there are lots of high-end, high-performance steels that I really, really enjoy. And it's fine to enjoy it, but right if i really am honest i understand that i don't need that okay that it's not I, i'm not i'm not doing enough cutting and i'm not away from you know how the house or the office or or a, some kind of option for stropping or sharpening a knife long enough that i need a knife that just holds its edge for two or three weeks Right. Even if, and most of the knives that I have go for way longer than that, just because of the sheer number of them. So, you know, think about it. If, if I switch out my knife once a day and I do that, maybe I've got 30 knives in my collection. So that means I'm only carrying a knife one day a month. So I'm only carrying that knife 12 days a year. Most knives are not going to go dull in 12 days. All right. Even in fairly budget friendly steels. Um, maybe if on a particular day, let's say you're carrying, I don't know, HCR 13 MOV, you know, you've got a, a tenacious and yeah, on one particular day you have to use it to cut down a bunch of boxes or do a bunch of, of, of straps or I mean, uh, uh, zip ties, you know, yes, you could doll in a doll out a blade in, in a few hours. It's possible, but most of us are not doing that kind of repetitive cutting. If you are, and, and then furthermore, <laughs> many people who are <laughs> the days that I do the most cutting, it ends up being with a construction knife. Anyway, an Olfa knife for cutting drywall or, you know, scraping out, you know, windows with, uh, with my more a chisel knife. So, the days that I end up doing the most cutting, I'm not using a high-end knife with a really good steel anyway. Okay, so in conclusion, you know, just keep in mind that, uh, you know, I, I don't say this to offend anyone or upset anyone, but I am trying to share a little bit of, of honesty here and go, you know, there are some knives out there that are extremely expensive. And well, I get the hype. I have feel it too. Before you jump in with both feet for that, you know, seven, eight, a thousand dollar knife, especially I, I will say this production knives that cost more than $500. They do bother me. Okay. I, I, I know it's a thing. I know Grimsmo's are crazy expensive. I know Koenig's are crazy expensive and, and, Anyway, um, it, it does, it seems unfathomable, fathomable that production knives are way beyond $500. Um, and, and, uh, I know that probably isn't a popular opinion, even among my viewers, but it, I feel like someone had to say, guys, there's no way that this production knife where they can crank out multiple hundreds every day, uh, could be worth this much. And, and that's where I would say this, some of those guys I get, I, I'm, I'm, this is an aside. Okay. Um, some of those guys, I get that there would be a huge capital investment, which would represent a great deal of risk to increase production such that like, and I use Hinder because he did this. Um, so for Koenig or Holt or, or, or others to increase production to meet availability would potentially leave them in a situation where everyone who wants one of their knives now has one and there's no more demand and it, it's not good. Okay. So I get that. And, and I get that there's, there's some very, uh, touchy issues to consider there from a business standpoint. So, uh, don't, don't take me the wrong way there. Anyway, uh, a lot of the knives that I like, a lot of the knives that I use fall into these categories that I've mentioned. And I'm happy to admit that a lot of the features on knives that I have, that I carry, that I enjoy 
are over the top and, and are not a, a, a wise use of funds in terms of efficient cutting tools. All right. And so it's more about being a bit of a knife nerd. It's more about getting uh, some enjoyment out of the exclusivity and, and interest, you know, visually and tactilely and, uh, you know, just geeking out over really cool features that leads me to spend those kinds of extra dollars and probably you as well. Uh, but I, I thought that maybe just a quick reality check for me as much as for anyone who's watching might be in order. Thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Don't forget to check those channel sponsors. You can get all that fancy crap that I talked about uh, over at White Mountain Knives. Use my discount code and you will save a little bit on, uh, on those purchases. Um, you could also check out Southern Edge Knife Works and and uh, you may save some money there using my discount code SHARPSTUFF as well. All right. Thanks a lot. We'll talk to you soon.